All right. Well, let me go ahead and say good evening to everyone. How are you all doing? Y'all doing all right? Well, I'm doing fantastic. I hope you don't mind that I'm doing fantastic. And I want you to do fantastic. I want you to get to that next level, okay? That next phase of experiencing perfect, faultless, overcoming health. We talked a little bit about that last night, didn't we? And it's possible. It's possible. And tonight we're dealing with a very, very specific subject. Does anybody know what we're talking about tonight? We're dealing with hypertension. I think one of the clues is that picture of that heart up there. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because that is unfortunately something that is really affecting a lot of people in not only the United States of America, but right here in Colorado. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and try to see if we can discover some clues. I got some things I'm going to share with you that I'm just excited. And, you know, the thing that gets me excited is if you just are willing to give it a shot. It's like I just can't wait to see and to hear about the things, the improvements that's going to take place. Because what I'm going to share with you, I can pretty much guarantee you, you're going to have an improvement. And so as we get ready to talk this evening about that thing that is called the silent killer, which is none other than hypertension. As we prepare to go through that, as you've already heard, you heard a few amens and you heard the terms like elder and pastor, obviously very religious terms. And in case you haven't noticed, you're in a church. So as a result of that, you know, we just want to go ahead and take a moment. And you're going to see that I'm even intentional. I'm actually already starting some of these remedial agencies to help when we're combating this thing called hypertension. You're going to see that even prayer makes a difference. And that's something I just wanted to go ahead. And if you would allow me to, I want to give just a short little prayer as we go ahead and thank God for the evening. And I want to thank God for all of you. And then we're going to go ahead and ask for his blessings as we go forward to understand a little bit more about hypertension. Is that all right? Yes. All right. Then why don't you bow your heads with me, please? Our loving father, our wonderful father, we thank you so much that you are willing to bless us even in such a late time as this in Earth's history, you still have more blessings to give to each of us. And we just want to avail our hearts to receive those blessings this evening. I thank you for everyone that is here. I thank you for the privilege to articulate this information in a way that by your grace will bring impactful changes in each of our lives. And so I'm asking that you will please bring to my remembrance what I need most that I may prove of the greatest benefit to your children my brothers and my sisters. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we talk about hypertension, it's obviously in this whole class of what ultimately we call heart disease, okay? And when we look at heart disease, there are several different types of heart disease that we should at least have some degree of awareness before we jump officially into the hypertensive stage. When we talk about heart disease, there's many different types. As an example, there is something called coronary artery or atherosclerotic heart disease that affects the arteries to the heart. Then you also have something called valvular heart disease. That's what I had. My heart was working really, really great in every other respect, but I had a bad valve, okay? You basically have four valves to the heart. So here it is, you got valvular heart disease that affects how the valves function to regulate blood flow in and out of the heart. Your valves are supposed to open and let blood out and supposed to close so blood does not go back in. When you have valvular disease, what's happening is the valves are opening to get the blood out, but they're not closing as fully as they're supposed to, and hence blood starts to go backwards, and it can cause many different complications. Well, you also have cardiomyopathy. That affects how the heart muscle squeezes. This is a very, very important function of the heart is that your muscles can squeeze very well and those walls don't get too thick because you need your heart to pump really strong when you're exerting energy. In addition to that, we have <clears throat> heart rhythm disturbances, best known as arrhythmias, okay, arrhythmias, and that can affect the electrical conduction of the heart. This is where you hear about things like, you know, uh, tachycardia, which usually means, you know, your resting heart rate should be anywhere from 60 to 100 beats per minute. If your resting heart rate is above 100 beats per minute, 101 and above, that is called tachycardia. And what that means is that there's something going on with the electrical current in the heart that's actually causing the heart to beat too fast. But you can also go under 
Now, I'm not dealing with those of us who are very athletic. If you're pretty athletic, then you may find your heart rate below 60 beats per minute. It can even get as low as 40 beats per minute, okay? But that's typically indicative of somebody who's really athletic. I mean, like some of these athletes you see out there in competitive sports. But if you and I are kind of maybe sedentary, we don't do a lot of activity, but you find your heart rate is just dropping and it gets under 60 beats per minute, 50 beats per minute, 40 beats per minute, that's called bradycardia. And that also is a form of heart disease where, again, we're having issues with the electrical current going through the heart, and hence we run into some problems. Probably the big one that, uh, you know, sometimes as we get older, you hear it more in the more senior ages than you do in younger, even though younger can get it, is something called atrial fibrillation. Whenever you hear about that, think about it this way. A normal heartbeat would go something like this. Okay, normal heartbeat. Tachycardia, when the heartbeat goes too fast, it'll just start going. But do you see that there's this consistent rhythm? This dun 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 dun. If it's bradycardia, you're more so gonna have. It's just gonna be, but you notice again, a rhythm, right? You know what atrial fibrillation is? It's just completely out of rhythm. And what happens is when the heart begins to beat like that, one of the things that it can cause is blood clots. And that's one of the big reasons why whenever you hear about atrial fibrillation or AFib, that's when you start hearing about doctors saying, if we can't get control over this, we might have to put you on some blood thinners. Because just in case, we don't want a blood clot to be produced, and hence you end up getting heart attack, stroke, and pulmonary embolisms, and the list goes on. Okay, so that's a pretty serious one when you think about the various types of arrhythmias, okay? And then you have heart infections. Heart infections are where the heart has structural problems that develop before birth, but it can also happen after birth. I had something called pericarditis. Now, we learned something yesterday, for those of us who were here yesterday. Anything that ends in I-T-I-S involves what? Inflammation. Inflammation. Excellent class. Well, here it is that when you think about pericarditis, you have a little sac that goes around the heart called the pericardium. And when certain things get inside, viruses and bacteria, it can cause an inflammatory response in that pericardium that it almost gives symptoms like a heart attack. But it's not a heart attack. It's just that there's an inflammation going on and your heart just has to pump a little harder. And it's a very easy thing to remedy. I'll even tell you about how I remedied it without taking a single drug. But nevertheless, the idea is that there's a whole lot of things out there when we're dealing with the heart. Probably the thing that blows my mind more than anything else is how preventable a lot of this stuff is. I mean, when you think about it, heart disease, we know, is the number one killer in the United States of America right now. Yet, it is perhaps one of the most preventable diseases. It was Harvard that actually put an article together, the Harvard Health Publications, 200 thousand heart disease stroke deaths a year are preventable. I mean, can you think, that's almost half because it's a little over 600,000 that die every year from heart disease and here it is up to 200,000. Now I'm going to show you that I think those numbers are even greater than that. Look at this. It says it's easy to think of heart disease and stroke as an almost inevitable part of aging in a developed country like the United States. After all, they are our leading causes of death and disability. But the truth is that these are largely preventable conditions. Now look at that little bottom paragraph there. New estimates from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention indicate that one quarter of all deaths from heart disease and stroke are preventable, and that is almost certainly an underestimate. That means that there's hundreds of thousands of people every year that die that don't have to die. Now let me tell you a quick little story that I wish so much it was just a story, but it's not just a story, this is the truth. I'm about to tell you the truth, but it's gonna sound like a story, but it's not a story, it's the what? Truth. It's the truth. There is a location in Las Vegas, a restaurant, and it's a restaurant like no other restaurant I've ever heard of, Heart Attack Grill. Can you imagine that? Heart Attack Grill. Now, this is a very unique restaurant. When people show up there, they actually have meals on the menu like triple bypass burger, okay? This is like the way they name it. They have you get dressed up 
in a patient's garb, like in a hospital. They invite you inside to get something to eat, but you have to pay for your meal before you actually enter into the restaurant. Let me tell you why. At the Heart Attack Grill, they actually have advertised. This is crazy. Like I told you, it sounds like a story, but it's the what? It's the truth. This, they have a display. This is like the display of displays. I mean, you've never seen a display like this in a restaurant, I guarantee you. You know what they display in this restaurant? They display a plastic bag. And it's filled with something. It's filled with ashes. The plastic bag is filled with ashes of a man who died right at the table eating one of their triple bypass burgers. Do you understand why they have you pay before you eat? They literally have you do this. And so the man displays, this is what happened to one of our customers. You sure you want to still eat here? Now, do you know what's amazing about this whole story? If you look up the owner of Heart Attack Grill, he used to believe in vegetarianism, and he once used to try to run a health food restaurant. But you know what he discovered? He discovered that people are not interested in being healthy. He said, this is not where the money is. And he was into this industry to make money. It's kind of like a lot of vegans today. A lot of vegans care more about animals than people. It's a little backwards in my opinion. I do believe in the value of animals, but I believe that much more in the value of people. For without people, even the animals wouldn't survive in this world. Well, here it is that he realized, you know what? I'm going to run a restaurant, and I'm going to put it in their face that, look, if you eat here, you're more than likely going to get sick, and you more than likely will even die at my table. He is already at cremation number two. They literally gave permission, you can take my ashes, or the family members, and you can display it to people to let them see. And people still go. So, I mean, when you really see something like this statistic here where it says up to 200,000 or more, you know, preventable, that is a fact. If people just simply had a little bit more self-value and self-control, it is amazing how we can just drastically decrease these numbers of heart attacks and strokes. But nevertheless, every time you go to take a look at the success of Heart Attack Grill, you will see a line around the block of people who are waiting to get in. How sad that is. I want to let you all know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and even if you don't believe it, you are created with purpose. You are not the result of an accident and have no purpose in your life. I would dare not put such a heritage on any intelligent human being. You are created by design. There is a great purpose for you to accomplish with your lives, and you and I should do all that we can to preserve our health and not to waste it away. Well... Here it is that the truth of the matter is, is that, hey, heart disease is quite preventable. But how much the more when we talk about this thing called hypertension? I've shown, I'm sure you've seen that little lady before, haven't you? Yeah. You know about that little lady. <laughs> you know, that's our little salt symbol, isn't it? You know, but we're going to talk about this silent killer. We're going to talk about the reality of how to release the pressure from high blood pressure. OK, and I believe we're going to go through some pretty powerful things. So the first thing I want to do is this. I'm going to give you like this super quick snapshot in the form of a video, just kind of explaining and walking us through what exactly is high blood pressure. So take a look at this video. Very, very simple, very quick. And then I'll come right, right, right back up and we'll go ahead and we'll dialogue a little bit more. Let's take a look and see. Do you know if you have high blood pressure? Find out how you can prevent or control it. High blood pressure when left untreated can damage the blood vessels in your body. It hardens the arteries as cholesterol and calcium builds up. Over time, the arteries narrow, restricting blood flow and damaging critical organs like the heart, brain, eyes, and kidneys. The first sign of high blood pressure affecting the heart is the thickening of the heart muscle. 
It now struggles to pump blood into the circulatory system through narrowing arteries. Left untreated, the condition worsens and all this time you do not feel any symptoms. Over time, high blood pressure further narrows the arteries, cutting off blood to the heart. When your arteries become critically narrow or if a piece of the blockage breaks off, it may result in a heart attack. A heart attack can cause permanent yes. damage to the heart muscle by affecting its ability to pump blood, resulting in heart failure. High blood pressure is a leading cause of kidney failure. Damaged blood vessels in your kidney affect its ability to filter and clean blood. Left untreated, the kidney will eventually fail and dialysis or a kidney transplant will be needed. In your eyes, high blood pressure can affect the tiny arteries of the retina. Bleeding and blockage can result in blurred or lost vision. When arteries harden in the brain, you can suffer a stroke that damages brain tissue. Some arteries may rupture, causing bleeding or hemorrhage. This can result in slurred speech, paralysis, and loss of consciousness. Do you know if you have high blood pressure? Find out how you can prevent or control it. Eat healthy, relax, lose weight, and take all medication given by your doctor, and you can control high blood pressure and stay healthy. Talk to your Kaiser. Now, I have to admit, there's some things I like about the video, there's some things I don't. Now, what I like about the video is a lot of the information as it relates to hypertension. What I'm not too crazy about are the suggestions they make if in the event somebody has it. Our goal is not to control our disease. Our goal is to get rid of it. Our goal is not to live with this forever. Even if we're told that you're gonna have it forever. I know many individuals that take hypertension medication and they'll ask their doctors, how long am I gonna be on this? And they'll say, pretty much for the rest of your life. And that is not necessarily true at all. And so I'm telling you right now, I have individuals that have had hypertension and I'm talking about vicious numbers. You know, you're talking about a systolic top number of over 200, okay? A diastolic bottom number of well over 100. And their doctors told them, you're gonna have to take this for the rest of your life. True story, when I, you know, now this is all that I do for a living, this is what I do, and I just love it. I'm living the happiest stage of my life. But I will tell you before that I used to be in corporate, and I held a pretty high executive position in the company I worked with, and I used to have engineers that would have to go with me when I would do meetings to meet with CEOs and all of these things. Well, I remember one time my engineer was driving with me in the car, and as we were driving, he took some pills out. And I said, hey, what's that for? And he said, oh, this is my hypertensive medication. I said, really, you got high blood pressure? And he said, yeah. And I said, OK. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, how long do you want to have it? <laughs> and he thought, what a weird question. <laughs> you know, what do you mean, how long do I want to have it? I don't want to have it. And I said, well, I'm just saying, you seem pretty content with it. And he said, well, I, it's not that I'm content. My doctor says I have to take this. If I don't, I'm going to die. I said, I understand, but would you like to one day not have to take that anymore? Well, my doctor said, I'll never get off of this. I said, man, do you believe everything your doctor tells you? You ever heard of a watermelon? So I had to tell him the watermelon story, <laughs> so, you know. I said, bro, eat this flesh, but spit out the seed, man. So anyhow, we started talking a little bit more. I said, let me show you how, if you do everything I tell you to do for a period of just two weeks, tell me what your blood pressure looks like. And you can run it by your doctor to make sure that he gives you a thumbs up on what I give you. He said, no problem. He did it in two weeks. His blood pressure was totally regulated, completely. And then he told his other brother about it, who happened to be like a senior pastor of a 4,000 member Baptist church. And then the pastor called me and said, hey, come by my church, teach this to my people. So my wife and I went over to his church and boy, talk about take charge of your health. We showed so many people how to overcome everything from hypertension, diabetes, cancer, asthma, lose weight, and the list just goes on. And so what I'm gonna show you tonight, I'm really serious. If you're willing to give it a shot, and whatever I recommend, you go ahead and you present it before your physician. As long as you've got a physician to, that cares about you, please listen to them. If you have a physician that doesn't care about you, please fire them. 
Go find a physician that cares about you. I am serious. You do not want people treating you like a number. You're a very special person. And if they are so busy that they can't treat you like a person, you need to fire them and go find somebody who actually cares about you. All right? That's just my little counsel to you. Well, when we talk about hypertension, let's just understand blood pressure in a very, very simple way. All right? Your heart, my heart, pumps approximately 1,900 gallons of blood throughout the body every day. I mean, that's just huge, isn't it? You ever bought like a gallon of water? You know, some of you might get a gallon of milk or a gallon of something. I mean, 1,900 gallons. That's just incredible. Well, here it is. It's going through your blood vessels in your body every day. Blood pressure is the force applied against the walls of the arteries as the heart pumps blood through the body. The pressure is determined by the force and amount of blood pumped and the size and flexibility of the arteries. So that's just a real simple point on blood pressure. So then what is high blood pressure? Well, it's very simple. When you think of high blood pressure, think of a snake. I'm going to in introduce you to a snake. I think you probably at least heard about it. You ever heard of a boa constrictor? Now, when we think of snakes, we're usually scared of them because we're scared that they're going to bite us and inject something in us. What is that thing we're scared they're going to inject in us? Venom. Is that how the boa constrictor kills its prey? Nope. The boa constrictor kills its prey by doing what? Squeezing it. That's where we get that word constriction, right? So when you think of high blood pressure, we just looked at blood pressure. Your heart has a normal pressure that it just pushes blood through and it allows the body to be properly nourished with all that life-giving energy. Well, what is high blood pressure? It is like a, va a boa constrictor squeezing its prey. It's just that we're not dealing with snakes. We're dealing with vessels throughout your body. And what's happening is those blood vessels in your body are going through constriction. They're being squeezed. Something is narrowing them. Something's squeezing them. And what we need to do is we need to find out what is causing this narrowing in our vessels that is causing the heart to have to apply more pressure to get the blood through. Now, for those of you wearing glasses, I'm sure you can relate to this. When you had to get your glasses, what did the doctor have to do with your eyes before he eventually gave you your prescription? He had to dilate them. And when your eyes are dilated, are they closed or are they open? All right, so if you have high blood pressure, you're going through vasoconstriction. Your goal is that you want to go from vasoconstriction to vasodilation. You want those blood vessels to open up more, so that way blood can freely flow through. So whenever you think of high blood pressure in super simple terms, it's vasoconstriction. Your vessels are somehow being constricted. There's some narrowing of some kind that's taking place. Either something is squeezing the vessel or there's something inside of the vessel that's causing the normal opening to get more narrowed. What you want is vasodilation. You want those vessels to open. You want inside of the vessel to be completely open that blood can freely flow through. So everything we're going to talk about is how to go from vasoconstriction to vasodilation. All right? Make sense? All right. Well, let's continue. So when we think about high blood pressure, when it's difficult for blood to flow through your blood vessels, the pressure against the walls of your vessels will increase. Okay? Now, this can cause high blood pressure, also known as hypertension. When you're doing numbers, what you want to do is, you know, there was a time that it used to say your systolic top number, diastolic lower number, bottom number, they would want your systolic top number to be at about 120, and then your diastolic or your bottom number to be at least at 80. But today, they're realizing that too many people are still even above that, but the goal is to try to get it actually lower. So now you're seeing individuals more so saying they want your top number to be more like 115, 110 and they want your bottom number to be closer to like 70. In other words, if you wanted to know, do I have really optimum blood pressure? If you're anywhere from 115 or lower and 70 or a little lower, that is absolute, ideal, excellent blood pressure. So from a goal standpoint, that's what we want to shoot for. We want to shoot to get not just at 120 over 80, we want to get a little bit below that. Like I said, like a 115, maybe over a 70. And that would be absolutely awesome, okay? So that's what we're going to go over tonight. We're going to talk about how to get to those optimum numbers, all right? Now, let's continue. When we think about who is it that has it, 
here are just some of the statistical facts. And I like this nice, diverse group that we have here this evening. Well, about 70 million American adults have high blood pressure. That's pretty much one of every three, uh, three adults, okay? But in addition to that, high blood pressure costs the nation $46 billion each year. This total includes the cost of health care services, medications to treat high blood pressure, and missed days of work. Even though there's millions upon millions of Americans that have hypertension, ladies and gentlemen, it especially affects those in the quote-unquote African-American or black community, all right? These are some of the unfortunate victims of this disease, probably more than any other class of Americans. African Americans have it over a third more often than Caucasians, and those 18 to 44 years of age have it more frequently than Caucasians. So anytime you're thinking about a health, health initiative, if you're around a lot of individuals that are quote unquote African American from African descent, but have adopted the American lifestyle, I think it's time for me to give a little quick story here. One day I got a chance to go to Africa. And now in case you haven't noticed, I'm black, right? So when I had a chance to go to Africa, I was quite excited about that because in my mind, I'm like, man, how many black people get to go to the land and touch the soil? You know, most times we learn out of a book. So I felt that this was an incredible privilege. I was sent there to do mission work. Well, when I went there, I got off the plane and I was going specifically to Botswana. When I got into Botswana, I went to the mall. Now that alone kind of shocked me. I was just like, oh, we have malls out here. All right. Well, so I went to the mall. But when I went to the mall, it was just mind boggling. When I went to the mall, I saw something that said, our national breakfast. So obviously, as a man who loves education, I said, well, let me go ahead and see what is the African Botswana education, you know, uh, uh, their, their regular diet, their wonderful appetizers and everything else. And I looked and I saw eggs, toast, orange juice, bacon. And I said, now, that sounds American to me. And I was floored to see that this was the quote unquote national breakfast in Botswana. You know, as I've traveled in many, many countries, continents, Australia, Asia, Europe, Africa, it is amazing how powerful America is. It seems like everybody wants to be like us. And so what you'll find is that this is not just something that's happening in America amongst African Americans, it's happening to Africans in Africa because they're picking up the American way of living. So this is a major, major issue. So when you're looking at your demographics, one thing for sure is in the African-American community, we are seeing that they are being, or we are being clobbered as it relates to hypertension. And we need a lot of help and a lot of education. But it doesn't stop there, because next up, ladies, next up, women are about as likely as men to develop high blood pressure during their lifetimes. However, for people younger than 45 years old, the condition affects more men than women. But let's notice this point here. For people 65 years old or older, high blood pressure affects more women than men. But not only that, this is where it gets even more interesting. Women have hypertension less often than men until menopause is over. So ladies, you definitely want to kind of really pay attention to what's going on in your lives, what's going on in the lifestyle of women today in modern American society that is causing hypertension to be a pretty interesting rise. So not only is it directly affecting all Americans, but in a very pinpointed way, it's affecting those in the African American community, and it's also affecting a lot of women. But do you know what, guys? You know who else it's affecting? <sighs> Unfortunately, Children. Can you imagine? I mean, that's almost something like unheard of. We're like children with hypertension? Really? Yes, really. Notice, NBC News, salty snacks, extra pounds sends blood pressure soaring in U.S. children. To the point, look at what it says here. Spurred by too much salt and too many extra pounds, blood pressure in America's kids and teens has gone sky high, creating a young generation at risk for serious health problems, including heart disease. I mean, can you imagine a child getting a stroke? I mean, that's something you normally wouldn't even think about, all right? But watch this. And this was the part that really got my attention. Notice the age 
of the children. It says here, the percentage of American children and adolescents ages what? Eight to 17. Can you imagine an eight-year-old with hypertension? A nine-year-old getting a stroke? Yes. This is the reality of what's happening in our society. And you're going to see why very clearly, and it's just going to pretty much blow our minds. Who, it says, 8 to 17 who have high blood pressure, a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, organ damage, heart attacks, and strokes, climbed 27% over 13 years, according to researchers from Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and other institutions funded by the National Institutes of Health. So the reality is, is that hypertension is affecting everybody. Even though there's certain classes in society that it may affect more than another, the bottom line is hypertension is affecting everybody, it would seem. And it's certainly not a respecter of persons. So the reality is we need to do something about it. So what do you think should be the first step when we're really dealing with hypertension? When we're dealing with a disease class, let's see. Wow, if I had an award, I'd give it to you. She hit the nail right on the head. Got an A plus. The first thing that we should do when we realize that a disease is present in our lives, in this case, hypertension, the first thing we should do is what? Ascertain the cause. Remember that. Whenever you're battling with a disease. Now, this is where it's going to kind of appear a bit contrary to what's often done in traditional medicine. In traditional medicine, you will notice that often it is symptomatic treatment. If you get a headache, we treat the headache. If you're having the nosebleed, we treat the nosebleed. If you're going through body aches, we treat the body aches. But what often is not done is what's causing this. And we learned a nice secret yesterday about addressing things from the perspective of cause. Anybody remember what we learned last night? What's typically in the cause? The cure is in the cause. Wonderful. That's why we want to address that cause, OK? Where do we get this idea from? Well, there's lots of medical books you could get it from. But there was a medical book we discovered last night that actually brought out this very principle before any of the other medical books in the world came thereafter. That medical book is today the book that's not often known as a medical book, and that's none other than the Bible. It was the Bible that actually brought this powerful principle out, the curse causeless shall not come. A curse never comes without a cause. Therefore, what should we do knowing that fact? The thing that we should do is the other thing we learn. The cause, which I knew not, I did what? Searched it out. That's a beautiful principle. Can you imagine if more of us live by that principle? I don't care what problem happens in your life, mental, physical, or spiritual. Always address it from the standpoint of cause. What is causing this? And then build it up from the cause to the cure. So when we think about hypertension, we want to talk about the cause. Now, somebody says, well, wait a minute. We're talking about disease, but it says they're cursed. Well, last night, you remember, we learned that in the Bible, the word curse was often synonymous to a disease. So a disease never comes without a cause. And that's the reason why whenever a medical practitioner tells you or tells me and they say, well, there's no known cause for this, we can say, thank you for being honest. There's no cause that you know. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a cause that can be known. It just means we got to search outside of the box. And boy, did we search outside of the box yesterday. We understood something about disease. Perhaps we never learned that in any clinic, hospital, or any other type of medical facility. We learned a major cause for disease is violation of something. Violation of what? Violation of God's law, whether it be moral or physical. And so the more that my life is in harmony with God's law, both moral and physical, I put myself in the best position to overcome and avoid disease. Well, let's continue. So knowing these facts, I'll tell you, like I showed you yesterday, you know, these mummies, you know, that we kind of learned a little bit about, wonderful article in 2014. Did you know that ancient money mummies prove heart disease is as old as we are? that literally the mummies in Egypt and many other places, they actually suffered with heart disease. Look at this. 
A paper published earlier today in Global Heart reported that atherosclerosis is surprisingly easy to find in the remains of ancient humans from Egypt, Peru, the Aleutian Islands, North America, East Asia, and Europe. Researchers reviewed compu computed tomographic, in other words, CT scans, of the mummies to detect calcification in the arteries. Can you imagine the ancient Egyptians suffered with calcification in their arteries, atherosclerosis? That's just amazing. Because remember, we learned something last night. The fact that it's so easy to find these calcifications, these residues and sediments in ancient people, is surprising, said study co-author Dr. Randall Thompson, an associate professor of medicine at the University of Missouri School of Medicine in Kansas City and a cardiologist and researcher at the St. Luke's Mid-American Heart Institute. It was surprising to us and a lot of people. So this is why, again, we know that these diseases go way back. And there was a wonderful promise that was given to us that if you do all of the things that I tell you to do, God said, none of these diseases will I allow to come upon you, which have come upon the Egyptians. And so we got some precious promises in front of us of how we can overcome a lot of these heart disease issues. Well, let's continue. When we start thinking about heart disease, a question that often comes up, especially with hypertension, my dad had hypertension. My dad's dad had hypertension. My dad's dad's dad had hypertension. And so often they'll say, Dwayne, you are destined to get hypertension. Is that true? No, that's not true. In other words, a lot of people say, what about heredity? What about the fact that there's just this thing of hereditary diseases, things that has passed on from generation to generation? Well, I want to talk a little bit about that, okay? When we think about heredity, some people say, well, as a result of heredity, I'm destined to get this disease. Well, I don't fully agree with that, and let me tell you why. Number one, if I were to look at it from two perspectives, I'm going to look at it from true science, but like I said, I'm also going to look at it from inspiration. When I look at it from the standpoint of inspiration, there was something that was stated a long time ago. And this is what it was stated. Thou shalt not bow down yourself to them. This is what we call the second commandment of the ten. It said, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now watch these next words right here. Visiting the iniquity of the what? Fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that what? Question. Do you see a generational curse in that verse? Do you see a generational curse there? Yes, I do. I see it. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers, but where did it land on? The children all the way up to the what? Third and fourth generation. But here's the secret a lot of people missed in it. Up until the third and fourth generation, but what was the thing that the fathers and the children all the way up to the third and fourth generation. What did they all have in common? They hated me. You understand that? They hated me. So I wonder what the next verse says. The next verse says this. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that what? Love me and keep my commandments. So did you see how the gener generational curse got broken? You know the way the generational curse got broken? the children stopped doing what their fathers did. So when I look at my dad, my dad ate anything that could move, okay? I mean, if it could move, it was potential for dinner. So that's how dad lived. So dad would come home with snake. Dad would come home with, I remember one time I walked in my house and I walked in my house and I was just, and I said, what ungodly scent is this? And I wasn't even religious. And I said, Dad, what is that? He said, oh, that's chitlins. And I said, what is chitlins? And he said, it's the intestines of a pig. And I was thinking to myself, that doesn't, like, fecal matter go through an intestine? And Dad's like, yep, you want some? I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we grew up in a home where, I mean, my dad ate anything that could move. His dad ate anything that could move. His dad's dad ate anything that could move. Dad smoked. Dad drank alcohol. His dad did the same, etc. So what I learned, what I discovered a long time ago, people get what their fathers had because they do what their fathers did. But if we 
changed it up. If we chose to allow that generational curse to be broken and to say, I'm not going to do what my dad did. I'm going to make some wiser decisions, some smarter decisions. You'd be amazed at how you can avoid having what your parents had. And so whenever we talk about this thing about, you know, heredity and everything, remember it this way. Heredity is like a gun. Okay? Heredity is like a gun. Is a gun dangerous? Only when it's in somebody's hands. Only when bullets are in the chamber. You get that? That's the only time it's dangerous. So heredity is like a gun. It loads the gun, but it's lifestyle that pulls the trigger. Always remember that. Heredity, it doesn't matter if your mom had cancer. It doesn't matter if somebody in your family had neurological diseases. It doesn't matter if somebody had heart disease running throughout the family. Just remember, yes, heredity is just like a gun, but it's your lifestyle that pulls the trigger or not. And so if you change up the lifestyle, then the trigger doesn't have to be pulled, and you don't have to get that disease, and the generational curse can stop. So that's the whole idea that we're presenting before you. I, would, I don't want to get too deep into the science of it, but I got to tell you, there is something about science that I love. How many of you have ever studied something called epigenetics? Remember I mentioned that last night? Oh, my. By the way of how you and I live, we can turn gene or genetic expression on or off, totally based on the lifestyle that you and I choose to live. How you eat, how you drink, how you dress, how you live. You can change it all up. And so there's a lot of science out there that says you do not have to be governed by the diseases that even plagued your parents if you just simply change up some things in the lifestyle. So let's talk about it. When we deal with the cause of hypertension, you know, there's a few things out there. So I have a little book here. It's actually put together by the doctors, okay? Uh, Dr. Hans Deal and Aline Ludington, uh, really wonderful doctors, and they chose to address disease from the perspective of lifestyle. The book is called Health Power. Really good book. It's good for the lay person. Anyone can get this, and you can study this thing out. Well, what they do is they have a whole section here just on the silent killer. And what they did was they kind of went over some of the things that causes heart disease. So I'm going to reference a few things on the screen that came from this research in the book. What are some of the things that can cause heart disease? Well, number one, when you think of hypertension, remember, there's two types. You have primary hypertension, this type of high blood pressure called primary. Hypertension tends to develop gradually over many years. That's primary. But then you have another hypertension called secondary. Secondary simply means that there's a previous disease first, and then hypertension came as a result of that disease. It's kind of like if you have certain problems with your thyroid, one of the secondary issues that can pop up is hypertension, okay? There's many things that can bring it on um, when you look at it. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea can bring on hypertension. So the first issue is sleep apnea, and then the secondary issue is hypertension. Then you also have kidney problems, adrenal gland tumors, Thyroid problems, like we mentioned earlier. Certain defects in blood vessels you're born with. Congenital is what it's called. Certain medications, such as birth control pills, cold remedies, decongestants, over-the-counter pain relievers, and even some prescription drugs. Sometimes the side effect is that it'll bring on hypertension. So it's, again, secondary hypertension. Of course, illegal drugs, such as cocaine and amphetamines, and then finally, alcohol abuse or chronic alcohol use. All of these things can bring on hypertension, all right? So there's either the one that you may have, if you have it, where it's primary, over years, it developed. Or it can be as a result of any of these other problems. So in either case, I'm going to show you how to address hypertension. But if you're in the secondary category, you'll remember we offered some uh, consultations. We want to go ahead and see if we can do what we can to sit down with you and go over one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, let's look at your primary issue, and then we'll address your secondary hypertension. So then that way, hopefully, we can be made whole by the end of that. Well, when we think about the cause, there are basically four things I'm going to highlight when you're thinking about hypertension. Number one is obesity. 
obesity. You got to start really working on losing weight. In fact, I would like to suggest that we all start taking a very serious look at what is called our ideal weight. I'm going to leave this book here up front after the meeting that if you want to kind of peek your head in it, you can. But there's a chapter in here where it actually goes over your ideal weight. What is your ideal weight or what should be your ideal weight? And it actually just kind of helps walk us through and really, you know, kind of know what should I be at? Because sometimes you can go before your husband wives and say, honey, I got a little overweight. And your husband might say, because he loves you, girl, that's just more of you to hold on to. <laughs> well, that sounds great. I get that. That sounds fantastic. Husbands, good comment. But you want to do everything possible to say, dear, for now, that's just more of you I can hold on to. But I want to help get you to the place that I can hold on to you for many, many more years to come. And for that reason, I want to encourage you that we're going to start getting on a program to help lose that weight. You get that? So we want to know what our ideal weight should be so that way we can have the deepest longevity. Again, this in here in the book. You can get a chance to look at that. Another thing is, what do you think that is? Sedentary lifestyle. Doesn't he look lazy? I mean, he just looks like laziness, doesn't he? He's just got his tie on loose. He's on the couch. He's not even sitting up. I mean, he's just spread out. So that, that brother's just like, look, I don't feel like doing anything right now, except he is working something out. I, I don't know if you see what he's working out there. He's working out that remote control. You see that? Yeah, you got to pay attention to that. I like this clicker. It's, it helps. But, you know, sedentary lifestyle, that, that can really cause some serious problems, even as it relates to hypertension, okay? In addition to that is arterial plaque. Things that are building up in those arteries, the walls of the arteries, that's blocking, squeezing, narrowing, and causing the heart to have to apply more pressure to get the blood through. And then, of course, how could we talk about hypertension without talking about salt, right? But let me ask you this. Is there any medical practitioners in the room, by the way? Okay, one. Okay, nine. Question. How many of us are shocked and surprised by the fact that salt is connected to hypertension. Like, you never knew that. Is there anybody who never, no, no one, right? Now, here's my next question. Because we know too much salt can contribute to hypertension, right? right. Here's my question. How much salt is too much? If you give me the right answer, I'll give you a reward tonight. I'll take it right out of pastor's pocket. <laughs> Think about that for a second. Haven't we heard for years, you know, too much salt contributes to hypertension? But like when you say, okay, how much salt is too much salt? Any salt, any salt. Any salt which is 100% incorrect. You know what I'm saying? Like medically speaking, it's like it's actually incorrect, but they say any salt. It's like that's not true. Hey, let me let you in on something right now. Don't do this in a rude way, please. Always remember. Your average PCP, okay, your average medical practitioner, do you know of their eight years in college, they more than likely got one to four hours of training on nutrition? Think about eight years of education, and they got one to four hours of training in nutrition. You know what that means? Doctors generally don't really understand nutrition. So that's not necessarily the person you want to go to to say, hey, how much salt is too much salt? Because they might say, uh, any salt. <laughs> not really knowing the facts. So if you don't mind, I'm going to give you some facts. Are you okay with getting facts? Yes. I like giving facts. I like giving facts that are amazing. Now look, what does that look like right there? Yeah, wow. Okay. I am so thankful. Two sources that I have with me. Again, health power. These medical practitioners chose to take a look at this. One day I was in France, and I got a chance to find out that I was just a few miles away from the man who put this book together. This book is called The Encyclopedia of Foods and Their Healing Power, put together by a medical practitioner that actually studied the impact of food on the body and how it can bring on disease or help eliminate it. 
And in this book, the Encyclopedia of Foods and Their Medicinal Power. Now, I was privileged to get a few of these shipped over here in the event that anybody would like to obtain it. If you would like to obtain one, make sure you talk to my wife. She'll be happy to furnish you with one. But I'm going to tell you what they referenced here in this book, which I thought was pretty powerful. In the Health Power book, here's what they said. Page 126, here's what they said. An average of about one gram or 1,000 milligrams, which is one-fifth of a teaspoon of salt, added is what an individual who is hypertensive should have to their diet. And when you look at the Encyclopedia of Foods, here's what they stated. The Encyclopedia of Foods, Volume 1, page 346. Approximately half a teaspoon of salt a day, 1.25 grams, covers the need for sodium of an adult approximately 200 pounds with a sedentary lifestyle. So what's basically happening is, is that you're not going to really do a lot of additional salt, but there is a certain measurement that you want to guard against. If you are hypertensive, you do not want to surpass these type of measurements in added salt. Now let me let you in on something. Even though you don't want to use a lot of added salt, one of the things that you can do is you can use a lot of herbal seasonings. So I am by no means suggesting that for the rest of your life you're going to eat bland food as long as you're hypertensive. That is not what I'm suggesting. You can eat absolute flavorful food. Not a problem. But you do want to learn how to switch it up. If you're going to use salt, I would highly like to recommend Himalayan salt. It's like a pink salt. It's loaded with a lot of minerals. It's not as free as your regular iodized salt, ionized salt. And as a result of that, the body metabolizes it better. So even when you use your salt, I would highly like to recommend get some pink Himalayan salt. You can get that from Nature's Grocers. You can probably get that from your Safeway. I mean, almost any supermarket carries it nowadays. And of course, you can get it from Amazon. Now, herbal seasonings. So even though salt is a contributor, I want you to just keep those measurements in mind so that way you can kind of know. Remember, every food group comes with a degree of sodium in it. It already comes with a natural degree of sodium in it. So you don't need to add a lot as long as you cook well. And that's why Sunday we're going to have a cooking class. And on Sunday, we're going to show you how to prepare food and maintain its nutrients. Yes, my friend. Sea salt is good. Sea salt is still better than the regular ionized. But I would recommend above sea salt that you go with the Himalayan pink only because it's kind of like your highest mineral content that affords for better metabolism, better metabolism breakdown. OK, but yes, yeah, sea salt, if you have nothing else, sea salt, stick to those same rules that we talked about. All right. Good question. Now, one of the things that a lot of people are not aware of is that when you're going through hypertension, I'd like to recommend that you learn how to pray, that you pray about it. People say, really? Pray? I mean, come on, man. Aren't you getting like super religious on me? Well, no, not really, because even medical practitioners today are talking about this. Here's an example. So today they're studying the power of prayer, and what they're finding is scientific evidence shows that prayer actually works with people who are hypertensive. So I'd be remiss if I didn't recommend this to you. Take a look. What they found is this. Studies have shown prayer can prevent people from getting sick, and when they do get sick, prayer can help them get better faster. Duke University's Harold Koenig, MD. An exhaustive analysis of more than 1,500 reputable medical studies indicates people who are more religious and pray more have better mental and physical health. And out of 125 studies that looked at the link between health and regular worship, 85 showed regular churchgoers live longer. It is not a wonder that the Bible says a merry heart actually does good like a medicine. Don't you think those little hearts in the pill are kind of cool? Look at that. I mean, isn't that nice? Hey, it took time for me to find that, all right? But it, really, a merry heart, a happy heart, a contented heart, it actually works upon the body like a medicine, OK? Now, when we talk about this, somebody says, well, look, man, I just want to pop a pill and then get it over with. Well, the reality is, is that you can pop a pill. You could do that. You can take your medication. But remember, when you take medication, you usually get these bonuses. Now, I like bonuses in the normal world. But some of the bonuses you get with you know, medication, especially hypertensive, it can get pretty rough. All right? So I just want to tell you a little bit about that. So I mean, I'm just going to give you just a kind of idea here that 
Look at this little video clip very quickly. It just kind of goes into the medications that are often given for hypertension, but also some of the realities that are connected with it. Take a look. Keeping your blood pressure at a normal level is a must to maintain good health. However, certain medical conditions as well as age make this quite difficult to achieve. Though there are many medications in the market that seek to aid people who are suffering from hypertension, most of them are known to cause unwanted side effects. Micardis, one of the most popular high blood pressure medications, has caused back pain, diarrhea, dizziness, sinus pain, sinus congestion, sore throat and upper respiratory tract infections to thousands of people worldwide. Norvask, another famous brand name in the field of hypertension drugs, also causes dizziness, drowsiness, fatigue, flushing, headaches, muscle cramps, nausea, stomach pain, and inexplicable weakness. The same is true for Capotin, one of the leading brands in the market. Aside from coughs and dizziness, Capotin has been reported to cause taste changes amongst its users. These side effects are caused by the synthetic materials found in these high blood pressure drugs. Now, I have an associate of mine in Massachusetts where I live where unfortunately uh, she was taking a very popular hypertensive medication and the FDA actually did a recall in 2019 on this very medication because they're finding that it's causing cancer. And so, you know, you're trying to overcome one disease, but often it can create an atmosphere where it can bring on something else. This is why, again, the title of our series, Take Charge of Your Health. Well, let's go ahead. What foods can contribute? Now, in here, in your foods encyclopedia, it has two arrows. One arrow pointing down. These are your foods that you eliminate. Another arrow pointing up. These are your foods that you want to consume more of. And what they're showing is, is that these are foods that can be used. And this specific, specific chapter here is dealing with hypertension. So some of the things that the book showed here, which I thought was amazing, was this. When it talks about foods that contribute to hypertension, what I'm about to put on the screen, if you're eating these things, it is more than likely contributing to either our hypertension or elevated blood pressure, even though you may not have hypertension just yet. Number one, the first thing on the list is coffee. A lot of people are not aware of that. It seems like the, you know, when a food product makes money, they will tell you it's good for you even when it's not. And so it is that we know that there's the Starbucks of the world and many other organizations today where they actually have the audacity to try to tell people that coffee is good for you. When we deal with diet and the mind, I'm going to show you some of the most shocking videos of what happens to your brain just from one cup of coffee. And you're going to see clear as day, this is not a healthy food group for anyone to consume. And on top of that, it causes vasoconstriction. Not only that, but also Black pepper. Remember I talked about that last night? Black and white pepper. And you can also include a lot of spicy foods. Depending on what countries we're from or what have you, or what type of cuisine we really like, sometimes we really eat a lot of spicy foods. Not good when you're dealing with hypertension. Also, cheese. Especially mature cheese. Your cheddar cheese, your parmesans, and the list goes on. Not good when you're dealing with hypertension. The sodium levels in cheese is exceedingly high. We're going to go through these food groups in great detail, especially on Sunday at our cooking class. In addition to that, of course, meat, especially red meat. But you can pretty much put any meat in there, including even fish, because unfortunately, even to eat fish and to enjoy it, you got to put a good amount of sodium in mingled with its flesh. Not only that, but Soft drinks. A lot of people love their soft drinks for various reasons, but they also have a vasoconstricting effect in the body. And then finally, of course, our good old friends, eggs, especially eggs with the yolk, especially eggs with the yolk. High level of, of sodium and also your cholesterol levels get pretty high, too, from the yolk. So these are food groups that are often very contributive when we're dealing with hypertension. And so if we really want to go ahead and do this, part of my challenge, and if we do a one-on-one, -on -one, you'll see that I'll bring this about more and still more, is you want to do the best you can in trying to get, decrease this amount of intake. First decrease, and then we're going to work on eliminate. But then we're going to get into what can you eat? Because the reality is, is that we don't want you to starve to death. Are there foods 
that can help reverse diabetes, I'm sorry, hypertension. Well, number one, these are what we call your natural diuretics. If you and I are on hypertensive medications, one of them is probably going to be a diuretic, which is basically to help get a lot of that excess sodium out through urinating. So therefore, it's going to kind of produce a lot of, um, kind of get a lot of, it's like, you know, a water pill, for lack of a better term. All right? When you eat a lot of salt, it causes tissues to swell. So let's say this is your blood vessel. And let's say this is your tissues right next to it. When you consume a high level of sodium, it causes the tissues to swell. So it's going to start pressing against that vessel. When it starts pressing against that vessel, the vessel gets narrowed, so now the heart has to pump harder, hence high blood pressure. So what do they do? you got to get that excess sodium out. So what they often will give you is these diuretic pills. And the diuretic pills is going to make you go to the bathroom. It's going to urinate out that excess sodium so that swelling goes down and the vessel goes back to normal. Well, did you know that eating a lot of raw fruit and raw vegetables works like a natural diuretic to the body? If you eat a lot of raw fruit and raw vegetables, on Sunday in our cooking class, we're going to show you how much raw fruit and raw vegetables you should eat. But if you increase your raw fruit and raw vegetable intake, you'll notice that whenever you eat raw fruits and raw vegetables, it has a lot of water content. And so it actually works like a diuretic, and it helps wash away that excess sodium. In addition to that, beans, beans, beans. Now don't worry about gas, gas, gas. What you can do about that is typically if you soak your beans overnight, and then you get them. By the way, I'm not talking about the beans in the cans with the high sodium levels. We're talking about your beans in its nice, dry state. And the more that you get beans like that, they work so wonderfully for causing vasodilation in the body and producing great health. In addition to that, whole grains. Whole grains. If you're eating a cereal, if you're eating bread, if you're even eating pasta, whatever you're eating, you must make sure that it is whole grain. If you don't know whole grain, that's an idea of a whole grain. A whole grain always has three components, the endosperm, the bran, and the germ. Okay? When you eat a grain, it was made to come like that. And you especially don't want to compromise your bran because of this thing right here, fiber. Okay, that's generally where you get your fiber. It's not going to be from your endosperm. It's not going to be from your germ. So you want to make sure that when you eat your grains, anytime you buy a cereal, get bread or pasta, whatever it may be, you want to look that thing up and make sure that it says whole grain. If it just says wheat, not good enough because it can be enriched wheat. You want it to say whole wheat. Okay, whole grain. All right, let's continue. Remember, I told you the other night that we're going to talk about foods that fight inflammation. When we talk about foods that fight inflammation, please remember, these are some awesome foods that actually fight inflammation, inflammatory responses in the body that can affect your blood vessels. So tomatoes, fruits, nuts, leafy greens, olive oil. Yes, fatty fish is there. A lot of people said, I thought you just said fish is not the best for me. Well, it's not, because if we focus on that fatty fish, let me teach you a little lesson here. You ready? If we're going to deal with the fatty fish, let us just remember this point. Remember now, your foods that fight inflammation, tomatoes, fruits, nuts, leafy greens. If you're going to do olive oil, please sparingly. Don't, don't do a lot of it, and don't cook with it. Olive oil does not handle heat very well. It becomes carcinogenic, cancer-causing. If you're going to cook with oil, I'll show you some better oils to cook with. But don't use olive oil for cooking. Use it more in its cold, pressed state, and just a little bit over maybe your salad or something. That's fine. But please, not too much oil. Well, when we're dealing with fatty fish, just remember this. A study by scientists at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle linked eating a lot of oily fish or taking potent fish oil supplements to a 43% increased risk for prostate cancer overall and a 71% increased risk for aggressive prostate cancer. Their report was published online in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. So you don't want to do a lot of fish or oily fish. That's why I, pr I present the alternatives. Use the alternatives. They work better. But ladies and gentlemen, if you want to see your blood pressure 
really go away and stay away, I cannot begin to stress the importance of adding this next thing to your diet. I want to encourage you to add this to your diet, if at all possible, as early as tomorrow. Are you ready to see what it is? All right. Our good friends, flaxseed. Flaxseed is so powerful in lowering blood pressure. Here's what it says. Supplementing your diet with flaxseed may lead to a significant decrease in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure, according to a report published in Clinical Nutrition in 2016. Here's what they said. For this report, researchers reviewed 15 previously published clinical trials. Anytime you hear clinical trial, that means it was tested on humans. Anytime you hear laboratory trials, it was tested on animals. Okay? So anytime you get a clinical trial, that's real thumbs up, because that means this has been tested on people and it worked, okay? Well, it says clinical trials with a total of 1,302 participants. What did they find out? Which tested the effects of flaxseed supplementation on blood pressure. Their analysis determined that consuming flaxseed for more than 12 weeks had a greater effect on blood pressure than consumption of flaxseed products for fewer than 12 weeks. How much flaxseed and how, much, how are you taking it? Right here. Some experts suggest limiting consumption to less than 50 grams or five tablespoons of whole flaxseed per day. What I would like to recommend, if any of you are hypertensive in this room, is you want to get the whole seed. Buy flaxseed whole. Do not buy it ground. Flaxseed can sometimes go rancid pretty quick. And you don't know how long it's been sitting on the shelf when they sell it ground already. Buy it whole. Get yourself a little Nutribullet or some type of coffee grinder. You grind up enough that can hold at least a container that can last four tablespoons per day for a week. Just do it for a week. Take two tablespoons in the morning. Mix it with a smoothie. You could take it with a yogurt. You can take it with applesauce. You can mix it in your oatmeal. Two tablespoons in the day. In the afternoon, take two tablespoons, sprinkle it over your salad. First of all, it actually tastes pretty good. Secondly, this is how you get literally a full day's worth of your alpha linoleic acid, that your ALA omega-3. You get that full benefit, four tablespoons in a given day. This is one way you will find it will literally, it'll tank your blood pressure. It'll take it down very low, okay? So I would like to recommend four tablespoons. Please pay attention to the note. Don't do it more than five tablespoons in a day, okay? Some people have suffered from hypotension. In other words, it drops your blood pressure too low, and next thing you know, you're, you're getting faint and you're passing out. So don't do that. Four tablespoons a day, good to go. If you're taking medication to lower your blood pressure, talk to your doctor or your dietitian first before adding the flaxseed in. Because if you're taking it with the medication, it might really knock down your blood pressure and bring you into hypotension, and you don't want that. Okay, so please consult with your physician before you ever adopt any of these principles. Number two, I can't talk enough about it. Fresh garlic. Keep some fresh lemon juice nearby and it'll knock away the smell. Okay, just take a lemon, fresh lemon, squeeze it, and you drink that, swish it in the mouth, and it'll take away the whole garlicky smell so you're not burning everybody's eyebrows off. But <laughs> fresh garlic, fresh garlic is absolutely phenomenal, and this is how you do it. During the three-month study in the placebo group, systolic blood pressure, that's your top number, increased with 6.3, and diastolic increased with 4.6. Again, that was with the placebo group. They, they were taking a fake medication. But then they had another group that actually took garlic, and they took it every day. So here's what happened with them. After the three months, the effect of garlic on systolic, top, blood pressure, after adjusting for baseline value, was significant. And this effect was more significant in hypertensive patients. So what you want to do is at least a clove a day. When you have your salad, now you do know the difference between a clove and a bulb. Yes. <laughs> I did this before, and somebody confused a clove with a bulb. They turned into an instant dragon. I mean, they were breathing fire. I mean, it was just, oh, man, we had to correct that. So, 
If you don't know the difference between, don't be embarrassed. I would prefer you come to me. Don't leave here. I know what it is. And you're like, I don't really know what it is. And then you try it. Come see me. We could talk privately. And I will tell you, I'll show you the difference between a clove and a bulb. One clove per day. Get yourself a little garlic crusher. Have a beautiful salad. Spread your flaxseed over it. And then take one, one clove. And then whoosh, you just crush that thing. And let it just spread there on your salad. And bon appetit. If you do the flaxseed, you do the garlic, and you do the final things I'm going to show you, you can kick your hypertension to the curb. I mean, seriously, this stuff works, all right? Last few points here. Some other things that you can do. Exercise. When you exercise every day, I want to encourage you to get at least, if you can, 30 minutes of exercise in per day. Cardiovascular, you know, something like a brisk walk or what have you. You don't have to go terribly heavy, but try to do some type of brisk walk. You will find that this is going to help you. Try to get 30 minutes in. If 30 minutes is just too much for you, get 10 minutes in. Master the 10, make it 20. Master the 20, get it up to 30. But the bottom line is, get it in, okay? Exercise. Get some good sunlight exposure. Try to get some good sunlight exposure, okay? In addition to that, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. I cannot stress the importance of hydration. Drink your water. Yes. What about the UV of the sun? What time Very good. We were, we were actually going to go into that. Excellent question. So my sister was asking, what about the ultraviolet rays? Because we know, and the lighter you are, the more concerned you need to be. Because you don't have enough melanin. Melanin is what filters a lot of those harsh rays from the sun. And protects the body. The less melanin you have, so the more lighter your complexion, less melanin. The darker your complexion, more melanin, okay? That means that if you're light skin, I'll show you. When we talk about exercise, I'm gonna go past this because, oh, isn't that nice? Hey, let's do that again. <laughs> do, 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 do. It's like, I like that. But, you know, exercise, when you think about your exercise, just remember, get some aerobic in there. You got a lot of things that can make up aerobic exercise, swimming, brisk walking, running. You know, you got a lot of things you can do there. When you think about your anaerobics, that's working with some weights. Get some weights in there. Use your own body weight if you have to. But try to get that in, all right? I'm going to go past that. Water. When we talk about your water, this is your bottom line. Half your body weight in fluid ounces. That's what you want to try to get in in a given day. I know we've heard eight glasses of water. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. If you're 400 pounds, you need more than eight glasses. If you're 80 pounds, you don't need eight glasses. So what's a good rule? Half your body weight in fluid ounces. That's a good rule, OK? And you just get that in in a given day. You don't do that in one shot, in a given day, throughout the day. All right? Very simple there. I'm going to go past all of these. This is just additional information. You don't need all of those. Ah, sunlight. OK, so when we talk about sunlight, one of the first things I would recommend here in Colorado, try to get it in before 10 AM and after 4 PM. Your UV rays are exceptionally harsh here. I mean, you got some high UV rays. And so uh, I was measuring your UV rays out here like midday. I mean, it, it, it gets pretty high. And so that's what you don't want to do is the midday. If you can, try to get it in 10 AM or get it in after 4 p.m., all right? Another good rule is usually when your shadow is short. When your shadow is short, that is when typically the rays from the sun are strong. When your shadow starts getting longer than your body, that's usually when the UV rays are less, okay? So that's just another way you can figure that out. Well, let's go ahead and talk about this. I'm going to go past those. All right, how much sunlight do you need? Here we go. Light skin, 30 minutes per day. OK, less melanin, 30 minutes per day. If you're dark skin, you want about 60 minutes per day. You need almost double because, so I need double, because the rays of the sun have to get through all this melanin before my body can properly assimilate it and let it break down to benefit me, all right? Without sunscreen, do not use sunscreen when you are trying to be intentional of getting your sun exposure. But again, you don't have to worry about sunscreen if you're doing it between those hours. But then also remember, your face, your neck, and your arms exposed is sufficient. You're not trying to do a total body naked thing. That is great, though. You know, just you know, do it privately, please, you know, obviously. But you know, if you can do full body sunbathing, that is awesome. 
but in, if not, face, neck, arms. If you get your arms out, you should be good to go. All right? And just be careful of sunburn. When it comes to herbs, oh my, you have a lot. Motherwort, motherwort is good for arrhythmias. Okay? Please, if you're going to adopt any of these, with the exception of one, there's only one there that I probably would say you can almost freely take. But with the exception of one, if you're going to take any of these, please talk at least with a naturopathic doctor or your regular doctor before adopting this, all right? Motherwort is phenomenal. Cayenne is excellent. Cayenne is an awesome vasodilator. Cayenne is an excellent vas vasodilator, okay? Also, CoQ10. How many of you take that already? CoQ10, very good, very good. Then you have, that's the one you could take freely, Hawthorne Berry. Hawthorne Berry is so phenomenal for the heart. It, does, it, it has valvular benefits. It has vasal or vessel benefits. And it's a food. So as long as you can eat food, you can take Hawthorne Berry. And go ahead. What form? I recommend syrup. The one that I get is from Amazon, and it's by Wise Women's Herbals. They make an excellent Syrup, Hawthorne berry syrup. It's Hawthorne berries, and it's also mixed with a little honey. So as long as you don't have any problems with honey, tomorrow we're going to deal with diabetes. If you have diabetes, I can recommend something else. But as long as you don't have any problems with taking a little bit of honey, honey and the Hawthorne berry mixed together, really, really good. Excellent, okay? We already learned about our dear friend garlic, so don't need to go any further into that. This right here, beetroot. How many take beetroot? Beetroot is thumbs up, okay? If you can get about a good four ounces of beetroot juice a day, you can get it in a powder form. If for any reason juicing is too much drama, you can get it in a powder form. You take one scoop and mix it in your water, and it's 100% beet beetroot. And you can just mix it in your water, you drink that. It literally provides like the nitric oxide and opens up those vessels. Wonderful. And it's really good, especially if you're getting ready to do like a workout or exercise, all right? Yes. What about super beets is very good. Super beets add some other ingredients as well, but super beets is actually very good. So as long as you're okay with the other ingredients, super beets is a good brand. It's a very good brand. All right? Beet juice has been shown to release nitric oxide, and it increases blood flow and oxygen exchange and improving exercise efficiency. So if you can get some beetroot in on a daily basis, just remember, drink a lot of water because beetroot is high in oxalates. And if you know anything about oxalates, any of you ever heard of kidney stones? <laughs> you know, um, if you eat things with, that are high in oxalates and you're not hydrating enough, it can help start forming those kidney stones. And guys, if you are curious to know what pregnancy feels like, get a kidney stone. And uh, you pretty much have come just about as close as you can to knowing what it feels like. It is painful. So please don't go there. Be careful. If you're going to take in a lot of beetroot, that's fine. But hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. I'm going to go past this. Now, I want you to see something here. That looks expensive, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, they're not expensive. Yeah, expensive is relative anyhow. But, um, you know, they're not necessarily. Put it this way. You'll probably not get one of those cheaper than $800, okay? So, this, you know, if you go to Costco's, you could probably get one for like $800. Um, they can go from $800 up to $5,000. This, I cannot emphasize enough how wonderful an infrared sauna is. Infrared saunas is what you would call an investment. Um, it is something because it helps combat cancer, it helps combat diabetes, it helps combat uh, neurological disorders, it helps combat hypertension and various types of heart disease. It even helped in building up individuals' ejection fraction. You know, when your ejection fraction, that's a pump of your heart, it, it, if your ejection fraction goes down, that's, that's major red light. That's danger. Because that means your heart is not able to pump blood and get it out to the tips of your fingers, to the soles of your feet, to the top of your head. So if there's anything you want to make sure that you have good in your body is a strong ejection fraction. Did you know that in Finland they, stud they studied over, I mean, 2,000, 3,000 individuals who have done infrared sauna every day? And what they found is that it literally boosted up 
from a low ejection fraction, it helped boost the heart back up to a normal ejection fraction. Infrared saunas are just walking miracle machines. So it is something. Say again. I know, right? <laughs> it's not exactly, but yeah, it kind of comes close to the fireplace, right? It's dry heat. You can get it up to about 150 degrees. And you want to sit in it 30 minutes. That's your medicinal time frame, is at least 30, 20 to 30 minutes. So what do they find out in hypertension? Two recent experimental studies, they showed that if you do it for 30 minute sessions, they saw positive alterations in measures of arterial stiffness, and they saw blood pressure drop by at least seven to eight points. And so the bottom line is, is that there's a ton of things that we can do that can combat hypertension. And what I want to do is I want to encourage you and leave you with this. If there's one thing that often affects us when it comes to hypertension is that thing called stress. And I'd be remiss if I didn't address that. I would like to encourage all of you to remember it's impossible to be peacefully stressed out. <laughs> Isn't that right? It's impossible to be peacefully stressed out. Can't have both. And according to the Bible, when I read John, the 14th chapter, Jesus says, peace, I leave you. He says, my peace, I give unto you. And then he actually says, not as the world gives, give I unto you. And therefore, he encourages us, don't let your heart be troubled. Let it not be afraid. And therefore, if you find yourself at a place where you're constantly stressed out, I would like to encourage you to just remember this little statement. Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you're weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Can anybody relate to this stuff? There's a lot of people that go through this. It goes on to say, your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You make a promise, and as fast as you make it, you break it. It then goes on to say this. It says, you cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. Then... The knowledge of your broken promises and forfeited pledges weakens your confidence in your own sincerity. And sometimes people actually get to the place they believe even God cannot forgive them. God cannot be at peace with them. But I want to let you know, you do not need to despair. What you simply need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. It's true. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections. But what you can do is you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will, and then something beautiful takes place. He will then work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. And there's a peace that comes with that. And I have partaken of that peace. And I'd just be remiss if I did not at least offer it to you because it's available right now. Hypertension can be defeated. And there are people defeating it every day. The problem is there are people being stricken with it every day. And there's more people that's going to heart attack grill than following the kind of instructions we put up on the screen. And so I just want to find out how many of you are willing to say, you know what? If I'm hypertensive, I'd be willing to give some of these principles a try Maybe for two weeks. Do you know that if you did this for two weeks, if you followed all these instructions just for two weeks, do you know that you'll see a difference in your, in your blood pressure? Significant. Not minute. Significant. Just two weeks. And so if you're willing to say, you know what, maybe for two weeks I'll give this a shot to see how this will work. And again, remember, talk to your medical practitioners. Pay attention to the fact that if you're taking certain medications, you want to be mindful of what you're going to start introducing because you want to make sure that you don't have what's called contraindication. You don't want things to start working against you. You want it to work for you. But if you're willing to at least give it a try, I'm going to ask if you'd be so kind. Why don't you stand to your feet with me? I'd like to pray for you and ask for some blessings to come your way, that you give it a good shot. And I trust that it will help in many, many, many ways, and it will prove a most rich blessing in your life. And I just want you to know that as you give it a good shot, I'm looking forward to seeing some great results take place in your lives. And I wish you God's greatest blessings. Let's go ahead and let's have a word of prayer. 
Our loving Father, we thank you for all the time that we were able to spend this evening. Thank you for allowing us to look at hypertension and see how there are things in the world of science, there's things even in the world of inspiration. There's some things that we can even consider just from pure common sense, that as we put these things into practice, we can see some differences in our condition. And I ask for your blessings to be with every single individual under the sound of my voice that may be hypertensive. Lord, I pray that you might bless them beyond their expectations as they just give some of these principles a good effort. And Lord, for those who are not stricken with it, oh man, thank you. Please preserve us from it. Help us to follow these principles and to do well and to remember that prevention is better than cure. And Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, may your presence go with us. Help us to get home safely and have a good night's rest and bring us back tomorrow where we will tacker, tackle the question, diabetes, is it really the sugar? Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you know anyone that is battling with diabetes, especially type 2, please invite them to come on out tomorrow. We are going to go over diabetes. Is it really the sugar? If you would like to know about any of the book materials that I mentioned, when you go out the doors, look to your left. You'll see my wonderful bride there, and she'll be happy to furnish you with information if you would like to obtain it. Otherwise, have a good night. Get home safe. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. Diabetes. Take care.